thank you everybody for joining us today uh, for this webinar on unpacking hard conversations. Uh, Jennifer considers herself a voice coach and when I think of a voice coach I think of somebody who trains somebody how to speak but Jennifer helps others learn how to best use their voice. Uh, be it collaborating on a team, presenting in front of an audience, coaching a colleague, or supervising an employee. Uh, Jen started her career as a high school English teacher and moved from the school to the district office to eventually become the K-12 professional development expert that she is today. She's dynamic as a speaker, presenter, workshop facilitator, and author. She trains and coaches administrators and others on successful instructional practices new employee support, supervision, and evaluation, generational savvy, having hard conversations, and effective collaboration skills. And I mentioned that she's an author. Her publications include Having Hard Conversations, Multi-Generational multi Workplace, Communicate, Collaborate, and Create Community, and her newest book, Hard Conversations Unpacked, which has already become a Corwin bestseller. In her words, we need to have to be we need to, to be able to have humane growth producing conversations with one with one another and be able to communicate as best we can with the work we're doing and with the kids we serve. With that said, I'm thrilled um, to introduce Jennifer and let me bring her up to the stage. Okay, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good afternoon, so, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. Well, and you're going to be in a lot of places coming up, right? You're flying all over the place. Yeah, I'm flying all over the place, always. But I know that so far here in this uh, in this shindig, I see somebody from Hawaii and somebody from Toronto that I know. So this wow. is like cult coastal, man. This is big deal. So <laughs> I'm delighted they're all here. Okay. So why don't I bring myself down and I'll bring your slides up, okay? Thank you. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. This is my first shindig, so we'll see how this actually kind of rolls. And we're going to spend today, again, as Mitch mentioned, doing just sort of a touch, a taste of this third book that I wrote called uh, Hard Conversations Unpacked. Um, it's not a sequel to Hard Conversations, but it certainly goes into a deeper dive around what that work is, and you will get these slides. So you will get my email, you'll get my website, you'll get my Twitter handle uh, a little bit later. So if you can't get them down now, that's fine. Um, I want to go into this whole concept, so I'm going to ask Mitch to turn it to the next slide. This to me is, it's a two slide piece and it is about conversations. And I just want you to get a sense if you do not know me and you haven't worked with me, where I'm coming from with the work on hard conversations because it can sound so um, mean or you're gonna yell or you're gonna do something and hard conversations have to be incredibly challenging and difficult. That's not my intent. My intent is for hard conversations to be humane and growth producing. So this is, um, this is Harriet Lerner, she's fantastic. And she says, our conversations invent us. And through our speech and our silence, we become smaller or larger selves. And through our speech and our silence, we diminish or enhance the other person and we narrow or expand the possibilities between us. How we use our voice determines the quality of our relationships, who we are in the world and what that world can be and might become. Clearly a lot is at stake here. So it's with that kind of intent of conversations invent us that we're going to be moving forward. Um, how, do you, how do you create and enhance a relationship even if it's a hard conversation and not diminish people? Well, many people wrote in uh, when they signed up, so thank you, and they wanted specific things to come from this webinar. Now, out of all of the hundreds of people that signed up, I really, we looked, me and Charlene Marr from Corwin, so thank you, Charlene, uh, took a look at what the ideas are that really resonated with you about this topic. And three of the questions that came up were really huge. How do I take out the emotion? How do I have this conversation so that I don't feel so bad and that they aren't going to respond so poorly? How do I deal with people who are kind of dealing poorly with it and deal and they're resistant? And one specific thing of how do I deal with parents? Now, there were many other questions, but we're going to try to address those three in this workshop. 
and we're, we've got an agenda that's that's got four slides to it. The first one is how do you deal with resistance? Well, one of the ways is to be as clean and clear and how do you deal with your emotions to be as succinct and cogent as you can and we're going to talk about outcome mapping with that. And then we're going to take a look at how do you manage that outcome mapping is sort of your pre-planning. How do you manage your writing and thinking through how you speak about your hard conversation in a way that will uh, not cause as much resistance on the other person's end. And then, you know, everybody gets worried. I, they're going to be resistant anyways, Jen. What are we going to do about it? And so what if they say this back? What am I supposed to say? So that's really the next piece. I'll give you just a few because there's so many good things in the book. And then really for you personally, how do you handle receiving feedback? How do you manage yourself amidst all of these emotions that are swirling because you have to have this challenging conversation. So we'll just tip into that little piece as well. So much more in the book beyond that. Um, the goal here is, as I say many, many times, we can all learn more about how to have humane growth producing conversations. And you could say skillful and compassionate, same idea. How can we be even more skillful at doing this work that's so terribly important for our schools and for our cultures? So one of the ways is through an outcome map. Now, I want to give my two dear friends, Bob Garmston and Bruce Wellman, some, some props here. They are a part of something called the Thinking Collaborative. You can look that up online. They wrote this book called The Adaptive School. And one of the things that they have in that is an outcome map. We're going to take the outcome map the idea of thinking before you speak, which is going to cause less resistance, okay? And we're going to really pay attention to these six bullets in terms of how we plan our hard conversation. I think, honestly, you will have less emotion in the hard conversation and less resistance if you think before you speak and you really don't bleh all over the person. Um, and, and you'll feel stronger. So as we move to the next slide, I'm going to go through the bullets. So Mitch is going to turn to the next slide, and this is the first two. Do you know before you speak what the problem is you want to talk about? Now, why is this such an important thing? Because I've heard so many people start a conversation where they haven't really gotten clear as to what they want to talk about. You want to, you want to cause resistance? Be vague. Be abstract be uh, not connected to teaching standards, be, uh, have adverbs and adjectives in there that make people inflamed, be clear as you can be from the minute that you articulate what you want to talk about because it's not working, whatever that is. And then the second question is getting into a space of the future of the desired state that you want, what do you want to see instead? If you sit in that first bullet of what's the problem and it's bleh, it's just icky, what's the point? You're just sitting in the muck of it. I want to know where you want to go instead. And when you move to a possible future, there's less resistance and more clarity for everybody. And you're going to decrease the level of craziness and anxiety and resistance that's in your hard conversation. And this is even before the scripting. Now, the third question that I think is so powerful that we don't do enough about is what does the outcome you desire look like or sound like? So people say to me, I really have to spell this out for people. I want the person to be a better team player and to collaborate more effectively during a PLC. And you want me to actually explain that you don't want them to sigh or roll their eyes or say, we've already tried that. You want them, you want me to actually spell that out? That feels really patronizing. And I say, you may not ever get to this, but I want to know what the look fors are. Because if the person comes to you with resistance and says, well, what do you mean? You better not say, well, I guess you were an adult. We hired you. You should figure it out. <sighs> resistance. Okay. So having a couple things at the ready are huge. And do not underestimate the jargon that comes in our field. Uh, Peter DeWitt just did a fabulous Ed Week blog about 10 words that drive people crazy. And there are words that drive people crazy that aren't wrong. 
People just don't know what you mean by it. So really be with the look for us. Think about rigor. What does that mean? Engagement. What does that mean? Um, infusing more technology. What does that mean? Be incredibly specific. So in case somebody wants to know what you're hoping for, you can articulate that. Having certainty around that, hugely helpful at decreasing resistance and getting the emotion out of things. Now, the fourth question, as Mitch goes to the next slide, is, is a compassionate question. And it asks you not to be a psychologist, but it does ask you to be allocentric, allocentric, A-L-L-O, C-E-N-T-R-I-C, not egocentric, allocentric. It asks you to think from the perspective of this person. What might they not have inside themselves at the present time in order to do these actions? And it asks you to be compassionate. It asks you to be thoughtful. It asks you to be kind of a problem solver. Now, there could be knowledge they don't have, it could be skills they don't have, it could be an identity they don't have, but it could also be, so as we go to the next slide, one of the things that I dip into in this book, as opposed to the last book of Hard Conversations, is I've discovered in the last number of years that I've been doing this work, that we need to be mindful of some personal challenges that people are going through. There could be a family a tra a crisis, there could be a life transition. I've worked with many new teachers over the years, people getting married, people having babies. The, the wonderful life transitions also create a lot of disconnect and um, problems for some people in transitioning their work uh, and kind of staying on top of everything. There could be mental health challenges. The province of Ontario is doing amazing work and huge work focusing on not just the student's mental health needs but the adult mental health needs if somebody's dealing with anger they're dealing with depression they're dealing with anxiety uh, how they approach things could be a mental health challenge there could be mental a medical challenge um, people are dealing with illnesses people are dealing with their family's illnesses and then one of the things that i don't think that we're as thoughtful about as we should be is the learning challenges of the adults we work with we are so magnificent and so thoughtful all the way through we when we transition our students through an IEP and out into the world, they then sometimes come back and work with us and they still have ADD and they still have dyslexia and they still have, they're still on the spectrum, they might have Asperger's. That particular individual is still working with us and the question is how might we adjust how we work with them in order to make this all work. That's just one piece. Another piece as we keep going, because we want to think from the perspective of maybe why is this going on? What might be one of the things that's working? There are so many things in the book, but I just wanted to highlight that slide. And then big uh, shout out to uh, Hazel Rose Marcus. She works at Stanford and her colleague, Elena Connor, they wrote a book called Clash, How to Thrive in a Multicultural World. You can get it on Amazon, and obviously Carol Dweck is a very good friend of hers. I know her as well. We're all near Stanford. How you know, It says everyone should read this book, right? But what I think is really important about this book is that it surfaces exactly what Mitch mentioned that Randy and Dolores are going to be talking about today. There is difference. So as we move into the next slide, I just want to point out, you could go into PhD theses about these uh, challenges and differences, not that we can't overcome them. I just want you to be mindful that in the conversation, if you're Caucasian and you're working with somebody who's a person of color or vice versa, could, could mindset, could belief, could upbringing, could ethnicity have anything to do with this conversation? It might not. It could be that there's gender differences uh, that might be at play, men versus women. You might be dealing with somebody who is of a different socioeconomic status and they have different values or understandings of how people are supposed to work together or how teachers are supposed to be. It could be that you find yourself more liberal and they are more conservative religiously. 
Um, we're having that conversation in the States right now. Um, it could be that you come from the Western Hemisphere and you're working with somebody from Asia and they have a different piece. So if you have a more individualistic side, they have a more collectivist perspective. Uh, I, when I go to Hawaii, I come from a different place from the mainland as when I work in Hawaii. Different mindsets about how culture works and how people work together and how people should teach and how people should do things. Are you from the heartland? We have many people from the middle of the U.S. that are in this workshop and some of us come from the coasts. You know in your bones if you travel to New York, it isn't like Peoria, Illinois. If you have a teacher that's come even from um, a smaller town in your state to work in your urban uh, district, it's a different thing, right? If you've got second career people you're working with uh, that have come from business and are now working in schools, that is at times a mismatch. Um, and at the same time, the global north versus global south, if you are working with Latin America, Mexico, the Caribbean, you're working with uh, colleagues or students from South America, different mindset than working um, with people from uh, North America, Canada, and, and the U.S. So that could be a piece of the puzzle. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that you might want to think about it. All right. So we're going to go to the next slide, and it says thoughts, okay? And this is where Mitch was mentioning that we could do a number of things. I'm thinking that we could go into um, questions in our little rooms just for two minutes, just for two minutes. But the idea of this outcome map, what's the problem? What do we want to see? What exactly does that look like? What might be at play here? Any questions just about that? And we'll finish up the map and we'll go to some scripting pieces. Please go back to your IMing and we'll take two minutes and I'll time it on my, on my piece. Thank you. So this is a, a time for you to interact and I'd like to, to encourage you to do one of two ways of interacting. One is that if you have a camcorder, uh, a, a webcam on your computer and a microphone, click on the avatar of another person and uh, start talking to them about uh, about outcome maps and uh, how you might actualize an outcome map and possibly any questions you have about at outcome maps. And if you don't have a webcam, this is the time to share the information also through the um, through the IM window. And if your IM windows are not open, the way you open them is bring your cursor over your avatar. Generally, your avatar is in the lower right hand corner and you'll see something called IM. And then you can start sharing your thoughts with other people. So uh, we're going to give you another minute or so. And, um, and then uh, Jennifer and I will come back up and, and we may do some more sharing. Hi, I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions for Jennifer, if you click on that Ask button on your screen, again, below your avatar, uh, I will get the question and then I can pass it on to Jennifer. And let me bring um, Jennifer back up. So, so when you talked about mapping, I actually had a question. <laughs> so, what, you, you, so, you, you know, it, it starts with kind of define the problem. And, and then you said, think about tentative outcomes. And so you made a distinction there, just not think about outcomes. You said tentative outcomes. So what was the purpose of the distinction between outcomes and tentative outcomes? I think because it's a collaborative process, because there's an other person that's working with you, you mm -hmm. aren't quite sure how you're going to get there if that's the ultimate outcome. I think that there's also the concept that Garmston and Wellman talk about with the presenting problem. What gets discovered as you start planning this many times is it ends up that you think this is the problem and what you realize is it's a much bigger problem than this one person and it ends up that it, it's a systemic problem or it ends up that I need to have a hard conversation with somebody above me, not a person below me because I should have clarified things. And, you know, I mean, it just, it, it's mm -hmm. so muddy in some ways that they decided to sort of allow for uh, an openness and called it presenting problem and tentative outcome. 
And, and I would think related to that is it's also difficult to have a real conversation with another person if the other person thinks that you're just, you've already thought out what you want them to do, in which case it's not a conversation, it's just a communication yeah. from you. They, you, you, I feel like you're a plant in there, in there, uh, that you're bringing them to, to the conversation. They would absolutely say that. They would say this map should be done collaboratively and mm -hmm. it's about an interaction. And I say, I absolutely agree that, but I want you to be more ready and to be mm -hmm. clear about what you want to talk about and what you'd like to see. Because what I've discovered, and we'll finish with the map in, in two seconds, is that for, I'll tell one story. Secretaries came to the head of HR and they were very upset and they came, no clear thing. They just said, we're stressed out. You know, hands mm -hmm. on hips, we're stressed out. And he said, what do you want me to do about it? And they said, I don't know. We thought you were the boss. You figured it out. And nothing came of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, it was supposed to be, a, you know, he would have been collaborative, but they hadn't been proactive enough. They had been so anxious. They hadn't been clear. And I don't want people to run in without thinking through their own outcome map. You can mm -hmm. ultimately make it be collaborative, but they, they didn't get anything they wanted. Well, and that's yeah. what I think of, if you didn't do your own mapping or your own thinking before you speak, you're going to not get anything of what you want because yep. you weren't doing that. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so now, are, okay. And is there anybody that you wanted to bring up and discuss anything with, or do you want to ask for, well, I did have one quick conversation with Patrick and then, and then we talked about students and then somebody else said, oh my gosh, I'm having hard conversations with the department of ed. And I wrote huge, you know, so, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm listening, but I just, we have so much to share. So no one. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Then I'll bring the slides back up. Thanks. Perfect. So we're putting the slides back up and the slide that we're getting to is we're finishing the outcome map because I want to get to the script, right? And I think that the last two questions are very much you thinking about what you can do uh, from your end uh, once you've had the hard conversation. If you're working with somebody as a coach, as a principal, as somebody who has a, a collegial conversation or with a colleague, Knowing what you know now, is there anything that you can do to support that person or to change up the context or uh, provide resources so this person can be more successful? I think that that's a very proactive thing to ask yourself before the hard conversation. It will decrease resistance. It will allow the person to see that you've done some thinking and that you're really in it to be humane and growth producing. And then my last question to you is, what do you need in order to have this conversation? Do you need somebody to be with you? Do you need to schedule a massage the day that you have the hard conversation? Uh, do you need uh, HR to support you with you know, data or descriptions? I just think that if you're asking the question, which many of you posed, how do I deal with the emotions and how do I deal with the resistance? One of the ways is to keep it as unbelievably clear as you possibly can. That way you're showing both care and accountability. And there is a way that that's not mutually exclusive. And one of the ways to do both care and accountability is to be very clear before you speak. Now, we're gonna go into the scripting. That's our pre-planning. And we're gonna get into, in the scripting, how do you take out the emotions? How do you deal with resistance? How do you deal with parents? So that's what we're gonna do now, all right? And I want to show you one slide that is so, it, it's just one quick moment. I have a cognitive crush on a guy named David Rock. David Rock is a psychologist. He is a neuropsychologist. Look him up. He is on the web. He's based in New York and in Sydney, so I don't even know where he is. But he wrote a book called Your Brain at Work. And what he speaks to, and you can get a free article about this, either by writing me or go to his website, he basically says each individual, each human being, comes into any interaction feeling threat or safety. Threat or safety. And so why are people resistance and where's that emotion coming from? It's because we feel threat. You need to just be aware that different people are threatened by different things. So I just want to share with you what he says we are all threatened by. You, me, my father, my four-year-old nephew, everybody, okay? 
Some of us are threatened because this conversation is going to mess with our status. It doesn't allow for, in your language, you're not honoring their, their uh, years of experience. You don't call them doctor uh, or missus. You don't acknowledge their role. Uh, you don't uh, understand what their importance is. And for some people, really mentioning that authentically in some way is important. Some people are going to be fearful because you have messed with their certainty. This entire rollout of an initiative or change of plans or having to shift their actions is going to mess with what they know they're supposed to do. And that's very scary for some people who like things to be just as they should be. Other people are going to be upset at you in the conversation if you mess with their autonomy because now they can't do their thing the way they have to do their thing and you're making it more certain. So you want to think to yourself, how in this script could I call things options as opposed to mandates? How could I say you can eat either the vanilla or the chocolate? You know, where can you provide a sense of resourcefulness and, uh, open-endedness. Some people are going to be upset because what you're saying is going to make them feel like an outsider. They are not part of the fold as you're talking. You're shaming them and excluding them. Uh, they may feel like they're not part of the, the, the in crowd. Um, I don't know what you're going to be saying, but you got to think. I know that right now people are starting to, as principals, uh, talk to people about shifting uh, grade levels. You might want to think about this person who's like, oh, I've been in fifth grade forever and they're my friends. You know, so how do you understand relatedness differently? And unions, very, very involved. Uh, fairness, that's not fair. Why do we have to do it this way? Why doesn't that department have to do it that way? Why are you making me do it and I don't have, you know, it's that conversation about equity versus equality. And so these five things are at play all the time. The question is, for the person you're talking to, which one is really painful if you don't acknowledge it? And you take that learning that you should be more aware of the needs of adults, the needs of students, because actually all of this, and if you write me an email and say, send me the student version of this, I've got a colleague who talks about this in the classroom. Um, but I mean, it's that idea. So we're going to move all of these scarf ideas into, boom, next slide, the scripting protocol. Because this scripting protocol comes from the last book and it's reconfigured with more nuance and more examples, uh, deeper understanding of, of different parts in this newest book. But when you set the tone, which is the first thing you're going to do, and I'll go through these bullet points and then we'll get to those other wonderful little things at the end. When you set the tone, how do you need to set the tone? Do you have to honor their status? Do you have to uh, explain what this is about and what it isn't about for certainty? Do you have to assure them that this conversation is not going to mess with certain things and their autonomy? The idea of setting the tone is to create that humane uh, relationship that you want to have at the, at the end of the conversation, but that you also acknowledge them and whatever their needs are. Now, less resistance is going to happen if you name the issue in a way, to me, that's very neutral. I call it the saliva moment. My colleague Burton Cohn said, you cannot, from the get-go, cause the person to grimace and then create a saliva in their mouth. So the issue naming has to be so clean and so connected to uh, things that don't inflame people that it will cause the person who needs certainty and clarity uh, a calming effect. So will examples. Now, as you're set, you, you set the tone, Mitch, I want to talk to you, respect you, here's the issue we need to talk about, here's what is not going right right now. No more than three. That's it. Three, no more, not four, only three or fewer. And people said, what? What's that for? I actually think in, in English, our conversations can go this far. You did this, and you did this, and you did this. 
and it might not even be you. Let's not even take you in. Let's just, there's this fact, there's this fact, there's this fact. So cut the you. But if you go, and then there's this fact, it just feels like you've gone a bridge too far. Okay. So I think to myself, think about the syntax that you're using and be pretty clear about that. That'll cause the person who needs certainty to feel much better, or they're going to ask you, well, what exactly are you talking about? What exactly do you need? Right? That's the problem. Now, what is the reason that we're having this conversation at all? What was the impact this not going right is? What is what did we have there? So you're telling me that 50% of my kids are not engaged. So what? The so what is that that's not okay. We want this number of kids engaged. We want the reason, da 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 da. da. Do not inflame by going I can't believe I have to tell you that this is a problem no no on that but you do have to clarify the impact you got to request an action and that's where autonomy and certainty need to come in what is kind of open my open-ended what's not open-ended uh, what can they do with other people what can they do by themselves you know you got to think which part of the scarf do I need to massage in and then you start a dialogue does this make sense? Can you understand this from the kid's perspective, et cetera? So, so much in the book about this, in both of the books on this. But you start thinking, how do I take SCARF and add it to the scripting protocol? And that's really a, a huge piece. Now, one of the questions, thank you, Mitch, was what's different when you talk to a parent? You know, how do I talk to a parent? I would think that in the setting the tone, you would want to show such respect uh, for their status as the mom, the father, the guardian, the sister, whoever you're, you're talking to, an understanding of everybody's role, an understanding of what they know, an understanding of what you know, so that, so that they feel a sense of status, they feel a sense of certainty, they understand that they are the caretaker, um, and that you're all there for the sake of the student. I would think that setting the tone and really setting the stage for the rest of this to be done in such a humane growth producing way would be huge. And then when I get to that last piece, I have it in bold. I think when you are requesting actions from the family, they will also want to know what you're going to do for their, their student. And I think it's a fair thing to say, this is what I believe this is what I think can, and you let me know, I don't know your family, you know, could you do this? A lot of autonomy with that. Put a few things out for the family to try, the student to try, and then promise that you will also be trying things. I think that shows such a sense of honoring of their relationship, your relationship, and that we're all in it together. So that you really wanna be very clear from the, the tone to the end, how uh, the shift would be with parents, all right? Now, so much to be said about this, but I want to get into uh, the next couple things. So I'm looking at this, and people say, that's all well and good, Jen, but what if they blah, 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 okay? And they freak out. And so in response to that particular need, I wrote, what if? They say, exclamation, you know, question mark, right? So that's chapter six in this book. And what I discovered was I really didn't have answers for all of these things. But I really worked with people across the country and across Canada and this country and lots of other countries to just sort of think, what would you say? So I just want to put up a couple of those things just to, for you to get a sense of there are ways to feel strong in the moments that you don't know if you can marshal your words and really say something. So what if they shout at you? Uh, it's a common piece. People get very upset. Could you say, you know, I'm open to having this conversation and I know that you're angry, but I'm not gonna continue to talk to you if you speak to me at that volume, okay? Now I want you to notice that my palms are down. This is not on the slide, but palms down. Your palms are not up, that's sort of beseeching. Okay, your palms are down. That gives the person a sense, not in your face, palms down, gives the person a sense that that's not okay. We ha we're going to stop, or you know, if you don't, if you talk to me like that, or next slide. Uh, here's another one. 
you know, I'm having difficulty listening to you because your tone is feeling like an attack. So you, I really would appreciate if you'd state it in a more neutral way. Hands down. Okay. Now, people say, I don't know if you are old enough, anybody out there, to remember Chatty Cathy. Chatty Cathy had a thing in the back. And what she had was, I mean, what you have to say, like, blah, blah, blah. you know, I need my diaper changed or whatever Chatty Cathy said. It's time for eating. But it's that idea of we need responses. Okay. And so lots of them are in here. Uh, what if someone says they don't treat us like professionals or uh, the district always makes us do this? So we've got a couple responses for all of those things. And if you have specific ones that you know aren't in the book, write me and say, well, what would you say if? Because that, I think, is really, really huge. Okay. Now, one last thing before we get um, to the next piece. What if they get off topic? Does that ever happen? People go, yeah, but you know what? This is also important. You know, and they make connections and they bring things up. You know, in 1902, you said blah, blah, blah. Okay. So here's a response that you might, that you might offer. Next slide. I think it's really important. I remember how I had palms down. I think that we've got to actually um, localize these things. Okay. So I understand that this experience feels like the one that you, you know, that we're talking about here. But at this point, and look at my, look at my, my palms here. At this point, that's not the focus of what we're talking about here. That's, let's focus on this, okay? So you're actually physically moving them. You could say, you know what? That feels like something that is not exactly specific to this. Let's focus on this. And even if you have nothing in front of you and you physically move, you're almost doing like a, a, a visual paragraphing, uh, as they would say, as Wellman and, and, and Zoller would say, a visual paragraphing where you put the stuff over here. Now we're going to focus on this, okay? So that you are not discounting. You didn't shove it out the door with your hands. You just said, you know, that's over here. We're going to focus on this. So that's a thought that you might have, all right? Next slide. Now, last up. Uh, life is so fun. We've almost finished up our time. If you are just, you know, those are a couple ideas, right? But I know that it's also, you can have all of these wonderful ideas and yet it sits with you and you, you leave this and you said the right things and you planned it. It's just hurts still. And people sting sometimes and they say really mean things. Well, this is something for us sensitive people to really honor. When people say, you're such a drama queen, or you're so sensitive, or you're so emotional, it's actually true. So look at Richard Davidson. The amount of time we need to recover from negative emotions can differ as much as 3,000% across individuals. Now, I had a math person um, at Toronto Catholic actually share with me, that means you let it go in a second, and another person holds on to it for eight hours. That's the difference. Some people sit with it all day, some people let it just fall off their back or whatever the duck back thing, okay? So are you one of those people that keeps things and holds on to things for eight hours? That might be, for many of us, a pretty reasonable thing that we, we sit with the gunk, it, except for the fact that it's getting into us in ways that might not serve our bodies and it's not helpful. So as we go to the next page, I want to actually uh, share with you just a couple things from the book. Um, on how we can have speedy, resilient, emotional digestion. So that's a great uh, concept from a guy named Alain de Botton, and he lives in London, and he said, you know, one of the things that we need in this really fast-paced world is to have, you know, speedier, resilient, emotional digestion. And I think that that would really help me because I sit with things. It makes me feel sad longer than might might need to be, you know? So I'm trying to figure out how do I handle it? Well, one of the things that I, that I have written here about things is physical, okay? So on page 71 in the book, I have do the Wonder Woman pose, okay? So I'm gonna try to share with you Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. If you do not know Amy Cuddy and the Wonder Woman pose, look her up now, TED Talk, do not leave this for 10 minutes, but TED Talk, uh, time.com talk, Stand like Wonder Woman. Now, I don't know if this is actually going to work, but stand like Wonder Woman, all right? 
or Superman, depends on how you, which comic hero you feel like you, you would appreciate. Stand like that or put your hands up for 120 seconds before you have a hard conversation. Amy Cuddy's at Harvard, and Amy Cuddy did some research, and what happens when you do that is that you decrease your cortisol and you increase your testosterone. And what happens is that you will come into a situation with a greater sense of sort of credibility, and the other people will perceive you as having more credibility. So you will physiologically have shifted your body, but they will also see that. It will come at them. And what a better thing to be experiencing in your body than, you know, to be physiologically credible. So I think it's great. 120 seconds, though, a long time. So go find a place, a bathroom, you know, your, your, shut your door at your office or whatever. But do the Wonder Woman pose. That's one thing. A um, couple other things. Psychological. What do I have here? Oh, I have a couple things. One is friend failure don't become it. The idea of I'm a failure, I'm a loser, not true. That's not, A, not true. I don't even know any of you, and I know that's not true. But it's the idea of you do not equate to failure. That's what I have written down there. You are not a failure. It might not have been the best conversation, but you shouldn't take it in and just, you know, slather yourself with failure. It was a conversation. It was a moment. And you've got to keep it outside yourself. That's a psychological piece. And verbal, I just, I always go back to this thing where people say, can I give you a little feedback? I want to tell you a few things. And I say, it really helps if it comes in a humane, growth-producing way. And people pause, and then most of them look at me. And they say, you know what, I'll have to get back to you. Because nobody thought about it being humane, and nobody cared if it was growth producing. They just wanted to share their experience with me. And I think that's not exactly what we're trying to get at here. All right? So let's go to the next slide. Perfect. We have another opportunity for questions. We're going to do a couple things here um, for the next five minutes, and then we have to finish up with a couple final pieces. So how about, hmm, let's see. Let me, well, d Mitch, I want to bring you up if people, well, bring, let's bring you up once, come back up again, and tell me if anybody has sent a question to you that I should answer. And then maybe we should go back into our our little classrooms. Okay. Well, so yes, one thing is that um, uh, Margarita Mariscal asked, mm -hmm. and she said, uh, "I've been in a situation with a coworker where where I was not sure, due to body language, how to set the tone." Mm. So you talked a lot earlier about our body language as we're having the conversation. Um, what should we look for in the other person and then how do we um, yeah, work that how in? How do we manage with that? Well, I think that we can't be responsible for their body language, clearly, right? They, If they feel shut down, if they're sitting back, you know, I'm not going to listen to you, I wouldn't per se run over to them, lean into their space. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not going to cause. But I do think that what we could do is be in a space of openness. I think that we could, mm -hmm. I mean, we can open our own body. We can keep our palms, you know, kind of open. We can keep our, our shoulders back. We can, we can sit up. We can move forth farther in. I think that that our body language, do, do you need to come across as more approachable and nod and lean in more? Do you need to have set it up so that you're not sitting behind a desk and they're sitting in front of a desk? Do you mm -hmm. want to take a walk? Um, do you want nothing in between you? I mean, I talk a lot about how, how context, do you go round table, changes the way that you're going to sit with somebody as opposed to this way. So there are so many mm -hmm. things, but I don't think that we can be I think if somebody is completely shut down, you might want to shorten your conversation, but you, the clearer is probably better. I think that, you know, I, I just don't know how much I can do to open up somebody else who's, who's like that mm -hmm. in the five minutes that, you know, that I'm going to have this okay. conversation. Good. And then, and then there was a, 
yeah, another, and I think this is a great question also from, um, and I hope I pronounced the name right, her name right, Mikkel Groff. Yes. Or Groff. Okay. Oh, He's from Hawaii. And so, so one of the things, and I have to say this happens to me all the time, is it's, it's one thing to prepare for a hard conversation. Um, but sometimes you're, it, it just hits you. Exactly. Like, you know, something just happens and, and like you, you're faced with, I got to have a hard, you know, this is going to have to happen right now. So what do you, what happens when a hard, when some, a situation comes up when you least expect it? Yeah, I think that one of the things that I've got to do is remember, how can I say this in as humane and as a growth producing way I can do it. I want to stay skillful and I want to stay compassionate. So I think mm -hmm. I ground myself. I think I probably take a breath. I think I probably put my, my feet down. I don't think I put my feet, I don't cross them. I try not to cross anything. I try to keep myself as open as possible. And I try to figure out which words are not going to mess with this person, but how clear can I be in as short of a period as I can make it. If I need to talk to somebody on a telephone, if I need to talk to somebody at an airport, if I need to talk to somebody who is playing, um, let me think, he was playing solitaire in the front of my workshop, um, mm -hmm. re, you know, recently. I mean, what do you do? You know, like, do you address it? Do you address it? And so I would also decide, I don't want to address it to everybody, but what could I say that would move the ball forward and it depends. Am I in an interpersonal relationship with them? I can bring in my feelings. Most of the time, it's just about what's you know on the table. Mm -hmm. But I think short, sweet, watch your saliva and think skillful and compassionate. That's it. And breathe, 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 breathe. Right. And, and actually, so a good comment from Patrick here was uh, always expect the unexpected. <laughs> Yes. But um, you know, uh, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. I will, I will say that. Nobody. But also, <laughs> if a came into your room and you were a principal, and they said, "We have to talk," blah, 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 okay, you would say, "I absolutely could." I have this map that I, or these set of questions that I think could really focus us. Can you just kind of work with me? These are my questions, and you would go through the map with them. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. yep. Just anything that could that could actually structure the conversation so that you are both facing the problem and they're mm. not coming at you. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. So both and then maybe, maybe you can do that by, by asking a question. And that kind of solves, that causes, it gives you a little bit more time. I want right. to help you, what can we do palms up, not palms down, right. you know, that kind of a thing. And see if we can work on it. So it's not coming at you, but we're working mm. on the problem, and we become we become collaborators, and we become people that are working together on something else. Okay, That's and then there was another question. There was from Montez Aaron. Um, how do you recognize personal issues, as as you know mentioned earlier, but don't allow them to just to get in the way or become just excuses? I think. We've been talking a lot about this in my workshops. I think that there is a place for both care uh, and accountability. And I think that we can honor that people are in specific places. We could acknowledge, we can um, assist as best we can in supporting and continue to put the hat on of the school and say, I need to speak from the school's point of view that we also need these, these things to happen. So that you're holding the care for the person, but then you are also addressing the accountability of the professional expectations. And I think if mm -hmm. you actually speak to it as, I care about you as a person, I see that there are some things that are going on, I also need to speak to you as a fellow colleague or as, somebody who's leading the school and say, I have to work on behalf of the students. And so I need to talk to you about that, but those, those expectations and I want to honor your thing. So we got to work together or, or this mm -hmm. is what needs to happen and how can you address that? But I think it's about naming that you care and then naming right. the accountability in a non saliva way. 
if that makes sense. And, and what, what's stunning to me is, as you're talking, is also um, what I've heard of is kind of future pacing. So you have these personal things in mind, and you come up with a solution with the person, and then you bring up the personal things and say, well, it, what, what, so what, how are you going to handle it if this happens? Which is, you know, one of those personal things. But how are you going to handle it when, um, you know, your spouse asks you to stay late, but you know you have to be in class? Where we've just talked right. about you're going to be on time. Um, so how are you going to deal with these? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going into a coaching mode, which is perfectly okay. There is nothing in hard conversations sit on a continuum, and coaching mm -hmm. and collaboration and directive hard conversations where you speak and find your voice are all on a continuum and every single one of them is valid and you just have to decide how to use it. Good point, great point. So I, I know we, we have uh, only just a couple minutes left over. I know you have a few other slides, so I'll, I'll come down and bring the slides Thank up. Thank you. So I'm gonna finish up really fast with these last couple slides just to share with you. I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Uh, we're going to finish with the question slide, and we're going to go to the next couple slides. Um, the conversation can continue. And if you really have questions, like this brought up something, I want you to write me an email, jennifer at jenniferabrams.com. Uh, find me on my website. Uh, text me at that number. Uh, call me. That's my cell phone. Any place in the world, I'm there. Um, and if you know me, you know that I really do respond. <laughs> and I'm at Jennifer Abrams on Twitter. The next couple slides just just highlight a couple things that you might want to uh, do. There are the books. I do an e-course. I've done an e-course. We split into two, and I'll share that with you. I come to schools, to districts, to to departments of ed, to to associations, to everything. And I'm excited. We'll put up an institute slide in just a second. Um, so there are many ways to do that. Uh, really excited about this new book that's in the middle. The multi-generational piece we did not bring up. I want to do a webinar on that. Uh, really um, important piece to think about. Think about who you're talking to by age. We didn't even get into that. If you're talking to a 62-year-old and you're a 32-year-old, there is a huge difference. You've got a younger admin, you're an older admin, you've got younger teachers, hugely uh, important and hard conversations. So all of those are, are available, as well as, next slide, two e-courses. Uh, which they call PDE courses that you could take if you're, somebody wrote me and said, I don't ever read just by myself. I need some something to focus on. I go, great, get, a, get an e-course and you can maybe get some units as well as take the, as, uh, as well as read it. And da -da -da -da, last slide on this. I'm so, oh, well, not last slide, penultimate slide. Please, I'm so excited to come and work with you all. It's where I get my juice um, and, and, and find such great friends and, and learning. And so bring me in, that's for sure. And one of the places that you can see me is, next slide, ta-da, the Women's Leadership Institute. I am so excited about this. This has actually just been, like, we just got the hotel. Uh, men are invited, women are invited, we're going to find our voice around what matters. We've got great people that are coming to talk about how to be a leader. If you want to be a coach, you want to be a consultant, you want to be an author, you want to be uh, an administrator, we're going to go to New Orleans, what could be more fun, uh, middle of October, um, it'll be terrific. So, so find us, I will be sending out so much and so will Corwin on that. Now next week, last slide I think, is Russ. Dr. Russ Qualia is coming next week, and he and I merge. I'm all about voice, he's all about voice. And so he's fascinated and beautifully um, connected and has so much to say about how critically important student voice is, as well as his newest work on teacher voice, which I'm very much merging with and appreciate him. And, and who doesn't love a guy with beautiful hair like that? He's just, he's just a treat to listen to. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll talk. We'll talk again. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you. Um, and I and I know you're, you're you're off someplace, so I won't keep you. But um, thank you so much. I um, this it, it's it's interesting because this is great for me, not just in my professional life. This is a, a lot of what you were talking about are things that I'm going to be using in my personal life as well. So so thank you, thank you very much. 
Yeah. And um, and and I hope to see you soon online, or maybe we'll be at the same conference someplace. Okay, and this is Mitch Weisberg, so I'm going to sign off from EdChat Interactive. Please join us next week for Rest Qualia or at a, or at a future event, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you for coming, and I hope that you got as much out of the session with Jennifer Abrams as I did. Uh, talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.